Hello, Mr. Montalvo here, uh, and today we begin Unit 5, looking at uh, the expansion and reform that takes place in the United States after uh, the American Revolution and the founding era. Uh, and then today's, le uh, rather this lesson series in particular, uh, we're taking a look at the westward expansion as America looks beyond the original uh, 13 colonies, 13 states, uh, to expand westward. Our objective is to examine the growth of suffrage for white men during uh, Andrew Jackson's administration and to examine the conditions faced on the Trail of Tears by the Cherokee uh, and the effect of that removal uh, on their people and their culture. Uh, today's uh, day one, Jacksonian democracy. We're going to understand what that means. In the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson won the majority of the popular vote. <clears throat> no candidate won the majority of electoral votes. And as a result, the House of Representatives had to choose. They chose John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams, uh, the son of John Adams, uh, spent money to improve infrastructure, um, suggested a national university, an observatory. Uh, most Americans objected to the amount of spending uh, on such programs. Years following Jefferson, there was a tradition of uh, presidents uh, limiting the amount of funding uh, that the nation would spend at the federal level. When running for his second term, Adams lost to Andrew Jackson. The age of Jackson was a time of expanding democracy in the United States. This spirit of democracy combined with religious ideas inspired people to improve society. Jacksonian democracy was based primarily on the principle or idea that more Americans should become involved in politics. Now, in order to do this, many states during his presidency uh, began to remove the property qualification for voting. Now, the Jacksonian era is often referred to as the age of the common man. And this is because white males, uh, this is when wh white males first received universal suffrage or the right to vote. Prior to this, the majority of the states required property ownership as a requirement to voting. Now, this limited the voting pool. Um, restricting voting only to those who owned property, which meant only those who were wealthy or had some level of wealth. Now, this is not a 100% a universal suffrage, unfortunately. Um, at this time, we have to note that women of any color or age or property ownership status uh, in many states were not allowed to vote. Um, African Americans were not allowed to vote. Native Americans were not even considered U.S. citizens or, or people, really, in essence, according to the Constitution. Um, so while this is a, a move in the right direction, we are nowhere near there. Now, during the 1820s, more people gained suffrage or the right to vote. Women, Native Americans, and, and many African Americans, that, as I had stated before, were still denied the right to vote. Slaves had no rights under American law. Now, the Jacksonian era is noted for the following. Voters, not legislatures, choosing members of the Electoral College, which meant it was more reflective of the people. Now, once again, you have to understand, uh, Jackson has an ax to grind uh, when it comes to um, the way the Electoral College was made up because it resulted in him losing his first presidential run. So that's one of the first things that's, that's corrected. Uh, the elimination of property and religious qualifications for voting. There were still some states that had religious qualifications for voting. Increased uh, rotation and election of government office holders, so the uh, institution of some kind of term limits. You can only hold that particular office for a certain amount of time. And the president as representing the common people. It's commonplace, one of the most romantic stories of Andrew Jackson riding his horse through the, um, through the White House and answering the front door in his bathrobe. The idea that he was a representative of the common people. 
Now, Native American leaders uh, such as Pontiac and Tecumseh were unsuccessful in stopping the invasions of settlers further expanding west. And in the 1820s, only 125,000 Native Americans still lived east of the Mississippi. Uh, many of the Native Americans were Cherokee, Chickasaw, or from the Seminole nations. The Native Americans wanted to live in peace with their neighbors. However, the land which they lived on was ideal for cotton. Jackson sided with the settlers, urging the U.S. government to set aside lands west of the Mississippi River, those non-productive lands, um, and force the Native Americans to move. Now, in 1830, Jackson pushed through the Indian Removal Act, forcing Native Americans to sign treaties, agreeing to move west of the Mississippi. Now, when we say agreement, it wasn't 100% agreement. Most were forced at gunpoint uh, or threatened with their lives in other ways. The Cherokee held out the longest. And in 1838, the United States Army forced them to leave at gunpoint. Thousands died during the march, mostly children and elderly. Um, however, the Cherokee's long and sorrowful journey west would become known as the Trail of Tears. Now, attached to this uh, lesson is an activity which involves several stations in which you, we can develop a better understanding of not only what the Indian Removal Act was, uh, the geographic context of the Indian Removal Act, but also the perspectives of the Native Americans who were forced to move. Um, and not only will today's uh, video lesson assist with understanding or, or completing the exit ticket, but this activity as well. So please make sure that you not only watch this video lesson, but do try that station activity before moving on to the exit ticket, because it will provide a more holistic or, or total view of explaining what the effects uh, that the Indian Removal Act had on the Native American people and their culture. And that's all for today. Thank you.